working? I can't tell if the audio is working. I think it is. <laughs> is it working? Am I just talking to myself? <laughs> Hi my beauties, my name is Dr. Stephanie Kappel and I'm a board certified fellowship trained cosmetic dermatologist in Newport Beach, California. And today I wanted to talk about under eye bags. And the reason why I wanted to talk about this topic is because I've seen a lot of it in my clinic this week. You know, I see 20 to 30 patients a day and a lot of you guys are complaining about that under eye area and it's one of the most sought after treatment areas um, as a cosmetic dermatologist that I see day in and day out of my, of my clinic. So I felt like it would be a good topic to bring up um, for today's video. And I've done videos on this topic in the past, but you know, technology and innovation is always changing. Different treatment recommendations may change with the times, so I want to keep you all updated. So before I move on, I ask that you like and subscribe and share this channel with anyone who loves skin science and um, nerding out on skin dermatologic topics as much as we do. Um, we've grown a quite a fun little family here on YouTube um, and I'm excited to continue to grow with you and also because I all of my content is non-sponsored um, I don't accept any paid partnerships and I feel like I'm a rarity on YouTube in today's world because a lot of dermatologists and other um, experts do and I chose not to and I haven't throughout my whole career because I love the autonomy to be able to recommend treatments or products or procedures that I really feel are truly best for my patients and I want to be able to change if I change my mind if something new comes along and is better I like the autonomy and freedom to be able to do that so I can't be bought or sold by any company I never have I never will and I feel that the authenticity in today's world is lacking and so I'm here to provide it for you so be sure to share this channel with anyone who finds it useful or who loves to dork out on skincare and aesthetics as much as we do Okay, first of all, what causes under eye bags? And why do we get these under eye bags? Why do we get tear troughs? Why do we get kind of these changes that happen as we gain wisdom and have birthdays and get older? Now the reason why is because the under eye area, which we call the periorbital area of the face, is different than other areas of the face. The dermis and the epidermis of the skin around the eyes is much thinner, so it shows the underlying morphological changes a little bit more um, readily or earlier than other areas of the face that are aging. So what does that mean? Underneath the skin, you have you know, the epidermis, you have the dermis, and then you have the subcutaneous fat. And you have these fat pads that overlie the musculature and the bony structure of the face, and they change over time. The fat pads, which you may have heard uh, referred to like fat pad herniation, sometimes the fat pads underneath the eye can kind of retract and move and bunch up. And so an area where there previous was, previously was a smooth transition between what we call the eyelid cheek junction now has this like puffiness, which sometimes people think is swelling, but it's actually the fat pad that's kind of like retracting up and moving in its place. So as the fat pad kind of retracts up and creates this puffiness under the eye, underneath it where the fat pad used to be kind of causes this like sunken area or what we call a tear trough or under eye hollows I think is what it's referred to um, a lot of times on social media as well. So there's different mechanistic approaches that we can do to rejuvenate this area to make it look better and I'm kind of going to break it down for you um, in this video because there's so many it could be probably overwhelming to the patient or the consumer who's trying to decide what treatment is best. Do I do laser resurfacing, do I do filler, do I do microneedling, do I do a tightening device, do I do surgery, and what do all these treatments have to offer and what may be best for you. So just as a disclaimer, you know, this isn't, I'm not giving medical information over YouTube, I'm just kind of trying to illustrate these different treatments and so you can maybe decide which would be best for you so when you do meet your provider, whether it's, you know, an oculoplastic surgeon or a dermatologist or a plastic surgeon, you can kind of know you've done your background research which I know you guys do because if you follow me you definitely are well read and researched um, you'll kind of know the background of these different treatments and their mechanisms of action and how they work and sometimes it's a combination of different therapies and knowing kind of your own anatomy and how your personal face is aging and the, the signs that it's showing you'll know what treatment option would be better for you so after watching this video you'll say maybe I'm not a tear trough candidate for filler maybe I'm more of a laser resurfacing candidate so that's the purpose of this video and I just kind of want to break it down so that it's not so scary when you do a search under under eye bag treatments and you get overwhelmed with all these different treatments. So I'll kind of give you the ones that work well, which ones are kind of a little bit more hype or more risky and how to combine these different treatments as well. 
So just as I mentioned before, those changes that happen, the movement of the fat pads, the thinning of the skin, you know, it causes these uh, dysregularities in that skin so you don't have that smooth eyelid cheek junction. And that is the smooth eyelid cheek junction in aesthetics. And this is what we learn in advanced fellowship training and in dermatology residency. When the eyes scan the face, the brain perceives certain things as beautiful, not beautiful, healthy, sick, old, young, and differences and dis discrepancies there. And when there's a break between that eyelid cheek junction, it makes us look old or tired or sick. Now this can be even present in younger patients who haven't really had the changes of aging take place, but they anatomically maybe have, you know, a fat pad that is, um, you know, not in the right place or doesn't give a smooth aesthetic appearance and in that case you know maybe a little bit of filler or tear trough filler will be needed but it's not always secondary to aging things become exacerbated unfortunately as we get older and we age and the face starts to change but sometimes it's an anatomical uh, variant too where you know somebody might just have even my little eight-year-old daughter sometimes will wake up in the morning she's like mommy I have tear troughs and so I have to be careful because I post so much in front of her she's a very uh, knowledgeable eight-year-old in the field of aesthetics and dermatology but she has little anatomical little tear tear troughs that may you know get worse as she gets older but it's important to know too is this a change with age or have I always had this and that will help us um, kind of determine what treatment options would be best for you too and how to kind of plan for the future and down you know the pipeline as these changes happen um, you can kind of know what treatment options are available or what you may want to have in the back of your mind for having you know five years from now or ten years from now and also looking at your parents and your grandparents and how they're aging take a look at your grand grandparents and your parents um, under eye areas to kind of get a feel for where you're headed as well because there is in our genetic blueprint how we age and how these changes in facial anatomy can transpire over time. So the first treatment I wanted to talk about are dermal fillers because this is probably the most popular tear trough filler, under eye hollow filler, and actually Vobella this year um, had FDA approval as an indication for tear troughs because no other dermal filler has been approved um, by the FDA for treatment in the tear trough or under eye hollow area. Now what tear trough filler does, the mechanism of action that it provides is when there's like a sunkenness right below that fat pad as it retracts up or wherever that there's that lack of consistency between the eyelid cheek junction, it fills in the gap. So instead of being like hill, valley, hill, it just kind of blends in that smooth transition to make it you know, appear that there's a smooth transition between the eyelid cheek junction. It fills in the tear trough, it fills in the hollow. And the way it works is by, you know, a hyaluronic acid filler. Um, I typically use Vobella in my office because that's the one that's FDA approved and I feel that Vobella has the most beautiful, natural, long-lasting outcomes in the tear trough area. You can also use another very low G prime um, hyaluronic acid filler like, you know, um, got RHA, I think there's a RHA, yeah, RJ2. Um, you could use Bellotero, you could use Restylane Silk, you can use um, Restylane uh, Refine, Define. There's lots of different fillers um, that you can use in that area, but I typically like Vobella. I've had the most experience with it. I've been injecting tear troughs since 2000, oh gosh, 2000. I think 13 or 14 and I've gone through different phases where I use different dermal fillers and sometimes they'll have a Tyndall effect and they'll have this blue discoloration because of the way the light bounces off at once it's in the tear trough area. Vobella doesn't do that. It looks beautiful and perfect every time and I've had great success with it. So that's the one that I use but you know to each his own and there may be other providers who prefer other dermal fillers for tear trough um, rejuvenation but that's the one that I typically use. And I served on the advisory board when the uh, Vobella got its tear trough indication. It was really great because we met, it was with an Allergan ad board meeting, and it was about 20 of the most world-renowned experts who do the most uh, tear trough and under eye filler from, from all over the world, which was really cool to kind of compare notes and talk to these other doctors to see what techniques they use and um, how they do their patient selection and candidate selection. So the most important thing to know about tear trough fillers, you have to be the right candidate for it. If the skin is too thin, it's gonna show through. It can migrate. You have to have a certain anatomy to be a good candidate for it. So if your doctor tells you, hey, this isn't gonna be a good option for you, tear trough filler is probably not the way to go, trust him or her unless they're not comfortable doing it, and that's why they're saying that, which you always have to keep in mind too. 
but trust him or her and their evaluation of you because if you're not a candidate, you don't want to waste your time getting tear trap filler and have it be lumpy and bumpy and see through and migrate and all these different deleterious side effects that you don't want to deal with. But when done the right way, I always use a cannula because a cannula is a safer injectable technique. There's less bruising, less swelling. Um, it's very comfortable for the patient. If you're a patient of mine and I've done your tear trough filler before, you basically numb up a little area with local anesthetic. I use lidocaine where the cannula inserts and you basically um, very gently and very meticulously put the filler into the tear trough area. And then, you know, I usually only do one syringe at a time. I'll do half and half, and they'll have the patient come back in about a month, and if he or she needs more, then I add more, but I go in successive approximations to a goal, because doing too much too fast is not the way you want to go either. It's more trauma for the patient. It's, it's usually not that much is even needed in the first place, so you kind of titrate it out and let it settle and before you add more. So not doing too much too fast is really important. Using a cannula, being gentle, of course, I say that all the time, not being heavy handed, and then choosing a provider who's very comfortable doing this, who's been doing it a long time, ask to see their before and afters, ask how they trained and who trained them, where they learned how to do this. Did they just YouTube this on the fly or did they go through an ACGME accredited fellowship, which I always recommend is best, if, especially for this type of advanced injection, or if they you know, trained at some you know, um, course or took a you know, course, how long have you been doing this and let me see your before and afters. Always ask that for your provider because this is your face, it's a high risk area and you don't wanna have to deal with side effects or deleterious outcomes or complications. Now I get a lot of questions and comments about, I feel like there's other YouTube doctors um, who've said that tear trough filler is not the way to go. And that's not true either. You always have to cite your source. If an oculoplastic surgeon saying tear trough filler is not the way to go, of course they want you in the operating room and they want to perform a surgery on you. And I feel like it's really important that even as a dermatologist, if, it, if something is beyond my level of expertise or something that's out of my scope of practice, for example, I've had a lot of patients who come in for tear trough filler and I'm like, no, you actually need surgery. Let me refer you to an oculoplastic surgeon because I don't perform that surgery. I'm a dermatologist, not a plastic surgeon. And um, I will definitely give them, you you know, recommendations for people who can perform those procedures. The answer is not to give you know a treatment that you don't feel is going to be best for the patient because that's one you know how to do and I'm a really big proponent of that. So any newer injectors who are following me just make sure that you always provide all your patients with all the options even if they're ones that don't fall in the scope of your practice. So that said, um, you know, I feel that there have been some um, videos out there saying that, you know, tear trough filler isn't a good idea and all the complications that can happen. But as with anything, with the right patient selection, with the correct injection technique and doing it the right way, it's a beautiful outcome and it can actually save someone from having to have a surgery when it's done appropriately. So usually when things go wrong, it was not a good um, patient candidate selection or it wasn't injected properly um, or, you know, for whatever reason it didn't go it didn't go well but usually that checkpoint system of patient selection will you know decrease the complication rate um, before it even becomes an issue so it's always important to keep that in mind Okay, moving on to another option for under eye bags or kind of um, rejuvenation of that under, under eye area. So resurfacing lasers. Now how does resurfacing lasers make a difference when it's a fat pad movement, loss of volume situation? When you tighten the skin on top of anything, it looks better. So you can use resurfacing lasers that are ablative, are non-ablative, and what that means is ablative lasers are a little bit stronger than non-ablative lasers. You can actually have middle of the road mixed ablative and non-ablative, like a halo. Um, you can actually even do a really light superficial fractionated resurfacing device like Clear and Brilliant, which is no downtime, no pain when you use numbing cream, and is a really light, airy, beautiful, easy treatment to go through. But if you do that every, you know, every couple, you know, couple times a year or three times a year, it will help tighten the skin on top. It'll help stimulate collagen and elastin that will smooth and tighten the skin that overlies those under eye bags, making them look better. So tightening the skin on top always will make things look better. Will it completely take the bags away? It depends on how severe those bags are. So it's important to keep that in mind too. And again, you can have anywhere from a clear and brilliant, which is the lightest form, to a non-ablative, which is like a Fraxel Restore or Fraxel Dual, or a combination ablative, non-ablative, like a halo. I don't have a halo in my office, but not because I don't like it. I just like Fraxel better, but it's also a good option. You can do a fully ablative CO2 resurfacing too, which has a little bit more downtime, a little bit more spicy during the treatment 
giving it a little bit more discomfort, but definitely worth it. And you can kind of mix and match these different laser resurfacing treatments. Say you have, you know, a clear and brilliant, and you're like, oh, I like that, I got some improvement, but I want a little bit more. And then you up it to a Fraxel Restore it next time, and you're like, I still want more. Then you can do a CO2. There is no such thing as a wasted laser treatment. Lasers will only enhance and help you, and um, except if it's in the wrong hands, of course, and it can cause scarring, and you guys wouldn't even get yourself in a position um, of that anyway, because hopefully you would go to somebody reputable and a laser expert, but there's no such thing as a wasted laser treatment when done correctly. And even if you do a non-ablative and later on you want to add an ablative, it's not like it negated the results of the non-ablative. Like they all are additive and they add on together with respect to results and outcomes. So kind of by the same mechanism, um, microneedling, tightening devices, Thermage is one of my favorite. You guys know if you follow me on Instagram, I post Thermage all the time. It's one of my uh, favorite tightening devices because it stimulates collagen synthesis, which helps smooth and tighten the skin. And for the periorbital area, there's a special handpiece that you can use for Thermage. You know, you have to use a different handpiece on different areas of the face because the arc of the radio frequency, which is the energy that gets put into the skin to stimulate collagen, has to go at different depths. Of course, you wouldn't want the same depth under the eye that you would on like the side of the face because the skin is so much thinner. Um, you also have to have an intraocular eye shield. It's important to know beforehand because sometimes patients get squeamish with um, having something put placed in their eye, but it's almost like a protective cor a corrective uh, contact lens. So if you're a contact lens where it shouldn't be an issue, we put some numbing drops in the eye, we put the eye shield in, and then we'll do the thermage treatment around the eye. It's not painful. It takes about 45 minutes and it's a one-time treatment and the results last about anywhere from five to seven years and it really helps tighten that periorbital skin. So whether you're doing a tightening device or resurfacing laser, or even microneedling. Now, I'm not a big microneedling fan because microneedling, I've seen a lot of bad, horrific outcomes and side effects from microneedling. Either A, it doesn't work and it costs a ton of money and it was very painful for the patient and they didn't see results. I hear this all the time. You'll temporarily look better for maybe a week after microneedling more because of the inflammation and swelling that transpires afterwards. But then once that subsides, you're back to your baseline. And this is what everybody, all patients have reported back to me, which is why I don't have a microneedling device or it can cause infection or post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So patients who have microneedling under the eyes, they end up having hyperpigmentation there and then they looked worse than they did before. So I just don't even mess with a microneedling device. I know a lot of people out there sometimes like it. I'm just not a fan of it because all I see are negative outcomes from it. So I choose to not have a microneedling device in my office. I would take a laser over microneedling all day, every day. And I feel like the um, results are more substantial and more consistent and it has a way higher patient satisfaction rate. So another option for um, under eye skin tightening to kind of hide the under eye bags, um, you may see chemical peels. I don't perform chemical peels in my office. I'm not a big fan of chemical peels because I do love lasers and tightening devices better, but chemical peels, um, I know a lot of my colleagues and my plastic surgeon friends um, use chemical peels, sometimes even in conjunction with a surgery or with a laser um, to kind of help tighten up that skin. I'm not a big fan because I always worry the risk of if that chemical peel solution gets into the eye, it can cause a corneal abrasion, corneal ulceration, and that's something I wouldn't want to have to deal with or my patient to have to deal with so I'm kind of risk averse um, with that respect and I'm more of a device girl anyway but chemical peels can um, definitely improve the under eye area I recently went to an academic meeting where some of my colleagues were presenting even phenol peels which is the strongest form of a chemical peel um, it's so strong that it actually usually requires cardiac monitoring when it's done over the face but I feel um, I, I've heard if it's just under the eye you don't need the cardiac monitoring but still that's a pretty gnarly peel phenol peels under the eyes that's getting a lot of um, hype lately in the medical community. So to each his own, I don't do that one, but that is an option for tightening the skin um, to minimize the appearance of under eye bags. Okay, so we've talked about fillers, we've talked about lasers, we've talked about tightening devices, we've talked about microneedling, we've talked about chemical peels. Now how about a combination of some of these different things? So sometimes, you know, doing, I always start with one treatment and I see how my patients do and if they want to add on something else to augment the results of that treatment to rejuvenate the under eye area, I'm all about it. I feel like doing too much too fast, it's hard, it blurs the picture and it's hard to see what's doing what, right? You want to see, oh, that tear trough filler really improved 
my under eye area. Not, I can't tell if it was the Fraxel or the tear trough filler, but you know, if I have to do two treatments at the same time, I will. Like if patients are flying in from you know all over to see me and they're just there for one day, I'll do both treatments or I'll do combination of treatments. But sometimes it's better to do titrate it out, successive approximations to a goal, so you can see which treatment is giving you the improvement and how it's looking better, and then combining and adding on treatments on top of that just to make it even better is the way to go. So commonly, you know, if we do tear trough filler, um, say to correct the under eye bags or to kind of smooth that transition from the eyelid cheek junction, and then maybe a month later we do like a Fraxel on top of that, that's usually just like a, that's a slam dunk. Like people do so well with that one. People of all ages, whether they're younger, whether they're, you know, more mature, and I feel that that's always a slam dunk. Other two treatments that I often combine are Thermog and Fraxel. And I've lectured at meetings at the podium to other doctors on this treatment. It, thermofrax is when you combine Thermog and Fraxel to stimulate collagen and tighten skin. And when you do it around the eye, it just basically makes the eyelid skin so much more smooth and tight. And they work by the same mechanism of action by stimulating collagen, but they do it in different ways. Lasers use light in the form you know, of collimated uh, light in a coherent wavelength and radio frequency, Thermage uses heat in the form of radio frequency to put energy into the skin to stimulate collagen. And both tighten the skin and both look beautiful. So I think it's good to understand these different mechanisms of action and how they work to help um, guide you with your choice with what would be the best treatment option for uh, minimizing the appearance of under eye bags. Now, going back to filler, when we do tear trough filler, I remember at the advisory board meeting, a lot of the doctors were saying they always combine Vobella with some cheekbone filler too because it just helps globally harmonize the area. So if you're just doing filler like in one area, and believe me, I'm not a big filler person, but for tear troughs, it can be pretty helpful. When you do a little bit of filler in the tear trough area, but say your, you know, your zygomatic cheek, which is this area right here, is a little bit flatter or sunken, doing a little Voluma or another high G prime um, equivalent filler in that area just helps blend that picture and puts everything in harmony and balance. When you're talking about the face and you're talking about dermal fillers and volumization, it's always good to do things in ratios and have everything in harmony and balance because when it's not, it looks off. If somebody's full and totally corrected right here, but then they have volume loss in these flatter cheeks, they've lost that S curvature of their cheek, it will look off. And so I feel that that's an important um, concept also to just keep in mind. If you do have tear trough filler, kind of um, making it all in harmony and in balance with other dermal fillers sometimes is best as well. And last but not least, surgery to correct under eye bags. Now sometimes these the options that I've discussed so far are all non-surgical. Of course, I'm a dermatologist, so I, I provide non-surgical options for my patients. But when surgery is needed for under eye bag restoration or to improve the under eye area, I defer to my oculoplastics colleagues and I refer to them. And I think it's important if somebody is a candidate for surgery or if you're finding this video because you're doing some research and you're planning on having surgery, make sure that your surgeon is doing it the new way because back in the day, they used to just suck out those fat pads and remove them. Well, it makes it look better temporarily for maybe one or two years, but then you look very gaunt and sunken and hollow in that area. And I have a whole cohort of patients who come to see me for tear trough filler because 20 years ago, they had a plastic surgeon or oculoplastic surgeon that just removed the fat pad. So the way they do it now is instead of removing the fat pad, and I don't perform the surgery, but I know about it. So you, um, you go in through behind the eye and you basically, uh, you're knocked out with anesthesia. This is when oculoplastics performs the surgery. And they basically cut that fat pad and they transpose it. They don't remove it or take it out. They basically just reposition it. So they tack it down down here so you have a smooth eyelid cheek junction. So you're not losing volume. You're just altering the topography so it's a nice, smooth, it's not hill, valley, hill. It's a more smooth contour and transition. And that's the way you want to go. You want to make sure that your surgeon performs the surgery that way. So that's an important question to ask and to keep in mind. And I know people always ask me what I've had done. You know, I'm mid-40s and I've actually never had surgery under my eyes. And I've actually always relied on lasers and energy-based devices to tighten up that area. I remember I was a second year medical student and I heard the lecture in aesthetics about, you know, the under eye area is the first to show our age and you have to be proactive and you want to stimulate collagen. So as you lose 10% of collagen each decade, you're making it just as fast as you're losing it and be proactive. So when I was in my early 20s, I started doing laser resurfacing under my eyes and I've been neurotic about my under eye area ever since. And last but not least, using an eye serum. I've been using an eye serum since I was in high school. I had a mom who was very much into skincare and thanks mom if you're watching this for 
teaching me that at such a young age, but skincare is really important and using serums that are chocked full and stacked full of actives that are specifically engineered to the eyelid skin is really, really important. So I launched my um, own skincare line, which I have a personal chemist, it's him and me, and we formulate together and no white label, I just select active ingredients that are specifically engineered for that eyelid skin because I spent years looking at eyelid skin under the microscope and I appreciate the histological differences between the eyelid skin and skin on other areas of the face or body. It requires different active ingredients and different vehicle delivery systems to help brighten and tighten that area. So my ECM eye serum is, you know, was my baby and my passion project because I wanted to provide something that would allow my patients to use at home that would kind of augment any treatments they were having in the office or if they didn't want to have any treatments just to help rejuvenate um, the under eye and periorbital area. But the active ingredients have to be specific for the under eye area. So today's video has been pretty much focused on under eye bags and there's other changes that happen under the eye. There's under eye dark circles, there's puffiness, there's fine lines and wrinkles, and I'll dedicate separate videos just to that. But it's important to know there's different changes that can happen under the eye and what treatments are best to target those um, different changes is always really, really important. So that about wraps it up for under eye bags. I hope you guys liked the video. Drop a comment in the comment section if I forgot anything or if I missed anything or if there's another topic that you guys want me to post on next week. I'm here for you. I appreciate you guys. And be sure to like and subscribe and share this channel with anyone who may find it useful. Thank you guys.